Hallo Linda, um, my name is Evelyn Lindner and I'm the founding president of the Human Dignity Humiliation Studies Network and one of the initiators of the World Dignity University Initiative. You are our director and we would so much like to hear from you more about appreciative inquiry and how you have developed it for us in a, in a way that it fits our path and our methodology. Oh, thank you for having me, Evelyn. I'm really happy to be talking about one of our key components of the work we do with the Human Dignity Humiliation Studies Network, and it's also part of our, our World Dignity Initiative. Um, the frame of appreciative inquiry is a type of philosophy and a methodology at the same time. And it really began in 2003 when we had our first meeting mm -hmm. in Paris. Don Klein, who is a pioneer in the field of community psychology, joined us for that meeting. And he pointed out that, you know, traditional psychology tends to look at the glass half empty and mm -hmm. focus on the problem. Mm -hmm. And he proposed that in the case of humiliation and human dignity, that it might be more useful to take a more strength-based approach, look at the glass being half full mm -hmm. and figure out how to refill mm -hmm. it. So over the years, I have been sort of the archivist of ideas mm -hmm. of engaging in an appreciative frame for beginning a dialogue on humiliation. And I have to give credit to the entire Human Dignity Humiliation Studies Network for helping us develop this sort of methodology and philosophy for doing this work. But let me say that, um, you know, we, it's your work that helped us understand that humiliation is one of the most profound forces that can disrupt relationships in our own lives, on a social level, and around the globe. I mean, it's very clear, and especially what we've seen over the last few years, how powerful the dynamics of humiliation can be. So Dawn proposed that this approach, the appreciation approach, can be a help be an antidote mm -hmm. to feelings of humiliation. Mm -hmm. And that is critical for us mm -hmm. to engage in constructive conversations in our meetings and as we take this work out in the world. So what does a frame of appreciative inquiry look like? Well, I should say um, we based the initial start of this frame by looking at the work of David Cooperwriter and mm -hmm. Suresh Srivasta at mm -hmm. Case Western Reserve University. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done some wonderful work on appreciative inquiry in many ways, and this is a variation that's tailored specifically to our network, yes. and we've been describing it over the years. And some of the um, pieces of taking an appreciative approach is really focusing on having a sense of relational cultural awareness, and by that I mean understanding our impact on other people in all of our mm -hmm. engagements and that takes a tremendous amount of humility which mm -hmm. isn't about holding oneself lower than other yes. people but it's about holding oneself in right relationships mm -hmm. we've used that term too holding oneself in right relationships as we engage in complex and often mm -hmm. difficult conversations yes. so Relational cultural awareness is understanding our impact on other people. Mm -hmm. Another um, way of looking at uh, the appreciative uh, frame of appreciative inquiry is to look at our ability and strengthen our ability to listen. In particular, listening each other mm -hmm. into, into voice. voice. Yes. Maybe you could say just a few words about what we did at that first meeting in Paris with the philosopher Ananes, mm. because that was such a great example of listening, uh, joining together mm -hmm. to listening people into voice yes. in that meeting. Yes. Uh, Arnenes came to our 2003 uh, conference in Paris. He is one of the most renowned Norwegian philosophers. Unfortunately, he has passed away since. And when he was in Paris, he was really, uh, I think, over 90 or approaching 90 and was sometimes tired. And uh, you remember how he sat there and he gave his talk. and. 
I was holding his hand on one side and his wife was holding his hand on the other side and we asked questions and in that way he could give a talk that touched us all deeply. Yes. Yes, and mm -hmm. you know that was such a powerful mm -hmm. experience. It's one of the highlights of our 10 years of working on the mm -hmm. the Human Dignity Project is that example of listening Arne into voice so mm -hmm. he can share this profound wisdom mm -hmm. and experience that he had accumulated over the years and to see all of us join together in that effort. Mm -hmm. So listening people into voice mm -hmm. is really critical for yes. our work on human dignity and humiliation and also listening to our relationships and being aware yes. of how our relationships bring about the contributions of people that are a part of the network. Yes. And this connects with uh, Mary Bellenke's work on connected knowing. Yes, say more about as, connected knowing. As opposed to separate knowing. And uh, I just saw, uh, you know, we are writing together a book. The moment is now, <laughs> just now. <laughs> and I wrote there, um, in contrast, the Western obsession with endless win-lose debate inciting anger that makes for marketable drama illustrates separate knowing. Separate knowing attempts to objectify experience, emphasizing logical arguments, objective criteria and a critical examination of propositions. It emphasizes in impersonal rules and procedures. This approach to knowing can blind us to one enormously important concern, namely that objectivity is the subjectivity of the dominant group. <laughs> oh. <coughs> Contentious debates that characterize a separate knowing approach often generate silence, mindless compliance and unnecessary concurrence seeking. Even Aristotle recommended a more connected approach of deliberate discourse or a discussion of the advantages and disadvantages of proposed actions which leads to synthesizing novel solutions that are the outgrowth of creative problem solving. So the, the, the debate, the discourse around how, not just what we say, but how we say it, how we say it together, how we move forward, how we create, co-create knowledge. I think this is uh, of crucial importance and I'm sometimes uh, astonished that in the academic realm this is not acknowledged because it is a deeply scientific insight. Mm. You know, if, um, if this approach bring, brings more clarity, this is the, pro the approach we should use in academia, in academic conferences and also in the media. Do we really serve clarity and knowledge creation, co-creation by using this combative style? Oh, that's a good question, mm. Evelyn. And actually, I think that's what our work has been mm. um, an ex manifestation mm -hmm. of trying to understand what happens when we reduce the dynamics of threat and humiliation in the room and get, have our energy go in to the dialogue, to getting clearer about ideas, to sharing ideas openly and struggling with ideas. Mm. And, and just to help people understand that this connected knowing model mm -hmm. is not just about being happy mm -hmm. and getting along mm -hmm. and being nice. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Say mm -hmm. more about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have uh, in, uh, during the years we have very, very often uh, encountered the, the almost aggressive sometimes um, counter-argument. Oh, you know, I want to be able to say no and to be aggressive and to be angry. Uh, and um, only then will the uh, clarity come out. You know, I don't, I, I don't want to gloss over uh, confrontation just because we, I have to be nice here. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yes. So mm -hmm. they think that unless it's a, a combat, mm -hmm. then they aren't getting real value right. from the work. Mm -hmm. And what have we, uh, what have you noticed in our community where we do have struggles, of course, mm -hmm. we get engaged in um, difference, but it seems to me that it opens the door to a more authentic um, conversation than what I often see in these contentious debates where people have to go into hiding or defend their ideas. What's your thoughts on that? 
I think uh, that um, our work is very transdisciplinary. Yes, yes, yes. It ranges from, uh, like in my case, I studied medicine. I studied the tiny cell in our bodies, up to political science, religion, history, all the from micro to macro levels. However, in I think in this, uh, what we talk now, what we discuss now, our background in f psychology uh, has some value. We both have um, looked at how, for example, I have worked as a clinical psychologist for a while. I was, when I studied psychology, specializing in the approach, client-centered approach of uh, Carl Rogers. And uh, there you see uh, how um, important it is to think through how we, uh, how we talk, how we relate. Not just what we, you know, but how. And um, how we can help each other to bring out what we think. Uh, s I think it's a good sentence to say, you know, let me listen to what I just have said to understand myself, <laughs> to understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. I have to listen to what I say and then I might understand. So, you know, this kind of growth, organic growth process of understanding that is a co-creation and yes. it works best when it is a co-creation and it can also entail all the anger of the world. Mm. It must entail all the yeah. anger of the world. However, if we alienate each other, then we break the bridge between us and there is no co-creation of clarity anymore. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I think Jean Baker Miller would call that waging good conflict. When, mm -hmm. we, when we can engage in a way that brings the conflict forward and still preserves the equal dignity mm -hmm. of all involved mm -hmm. and preserves a relationship so we can continue that dialogue to gain clarity. Mm -hmm. And really that's what we in our network and all the members mm -hmm. of our network help us co-create as we um, take these ideas into the work that we're doing and out into the world. Yes. So and it is not. It is it is a, a new concept because it's not friendship. No. It's not uh, that we are just personal friends. Right. It's not that we are uh, connected in a cult. We're right. not. <laughs> uh, we are, uh, you know, we are connected in deep mutual authenticity yes, and yes. integrity. This is a, a very different uh, concept and approach, and we have seen that this is that there is no cultural script for that. Yes. Because we think in private life, professional life. Yes. Uh, yes. And in private life, we can have friendships yes. and love in our families. And in professional life, we should not be human beings. Yes. We should be filling a role. That is for being professional. Yeah. And we develop a new way of living in this world. Yes. Yes. So mm -hmm. it's really about remembering to connect as humans to yes. humans beyond and with our expertise and uh, skills yes. that we bring to the relationship, but not to discount that we are really human beings yes. connecting as human beings. And that can be our strength I and think this is, this is excellence. It's uh, yeah. brilliance. It's also academic scientific brilliance, mm -hmm. much more than denying the uh, relational aspect of social science, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. I think, I think that's where we're headed in our yes. work. And I have to say, we know we, this appreciative frame doesn't mean it's all hard, heavy struggle mm -hmm. work that actually Dawn reminded us early on that it's very important that we can take our work seriously, but also take ourselves lightly. Mm -hmm. So finding a sense of lightness as we move the work forward and really building on the strengths and the uh, contributions of many people as part of taking our work seriously but taking ourselves lightly and, and uh, finding ways to connect uh, around humor, around uh, the stories of our lives that really bring out our humanity. Perhaps we can conclude with uh, um, describing what the message we received from Inga Booster the Vice Rector of the University in Oslo after the 
horrible, horrible events that happened on the 22nd of July this year in Norway. You might uh, remember the shootings in, in, at, at the Utøya Island and the bomb attack in Oslo. She said, please go and have a dialogue every day with a person you deeply disagree with. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's mm -hmm. very good and that's mm -hmm. such a profound statement because mm -hmm. it really speaks to one of our key principles that none of us is as smart as mm -hmm. all of us as the Japanese proverb says. And so having those dignifying dialogues mm -hmm. with people that with whom we have a big difference mm -hmm. is part of practicing an appreciative yes. frame. So thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Wait, we have to stop now. Stop.